Well, good evening. Uh, surprise, uh, you're expecting <laughs> Pastor Ed tonight, and instead you get Mark and Brad. What a disappointment. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> it happens every once in a while. Um, you know, I guess uh, Pastor Ed needed a break. Uh, yes. We're okay with that. Well, he kept talking about all that coffee and the cake and stuff like oh, that, yeah. so we just wanted a piece of that, I think. I guess so. <laughs> um, you know, um, everybody uses some excuse to get away once in a while. Yeah. So, uh, and he happened to have us around, so he said, "Hey, why don't you guys take over tonight?" And so we're uh, we're here, and we're going to look at Acts chapter five tonight. Before we do, we're going to pray together and then do some explaining to start off. Why don't there you we go. do that? Uh, Father, thank you that we can be together tonight. We look forward to looking into your word, seeing what you um, might have for us because the scriptures are written that uh, we might know you and then we might be able to walk with you and discover how to live for Christ and appreciate and enjoy all that you've given us. I pray that you'll bless this evening, bless Pastor Ed as he takes a break and Donna, and I pray that uh, this will be a great time together. Thank you for all you've done for us in Christ's name, amen. Well, this yeah. evening as we start, you'll notice our masks aren't on. It doesn't work too well with our mask on, does yeah. it? I watched uh, Jennifer Formosa on Fox 5 tonight. She had her mask. <laughs> man, she had a big mask all yeah. over her face, and I thought, that doesn't work uh, to be able to talk to us about a situation. But, uh, Brad, you, you've you had your shot, right? Yep. Yeah. Yesterday was actually my two weeks post-second shot. shot was yesterday. Okay. So, yeah, and feeling I, good. I had mine a um, month or two ago. Yeah. I snuck in. Somebody, they, yeah. they, you know, they called up and said, hey, we're... We're going to throw this stuff away. You want to get your shot? So there you, go. you bet I did. Yep. And, uh, you know, and there's a couple of reasons for it. I want to, I want to care for the people around me. Yeah, me too. And, and uh, you know, and I, and I don't want to get the massive effects of the no, virus. And, yeah. and we're so glad to tell you that for those of you who, um, oh, yeah. we're, we're so glad to have all of you with us tonight from wherever you're uh, logging in. But also just to tell you the congregation here at Living Faith that Edgar Reyes, we spoke with him today, this morning on a call. He's doing so much better. Uh, he's our finance manager and we're just glad to have him uh, improving. We look forward to having him back at work soon. He's such an encouragement. He's a Barnabas and we're going to talk about <laughs> Barnabas uh, yeah. tonight a little bit. But um, so anyway, we've had our shots. We're in good shape. Six feet apart, there mouth to mouth probably. We're, yep. we're there. And, and uh, so anyway, we're going to talk about Acts and, and uh, what God did in the early church and we're going we're gonna to discover some things, I think, tonight, just uh, some, some elementary things, but also some dynamic things that probably help us walk with God a little better, I hope so. I, I want to take us back a little bit, Brad, uh, to Acts chapter 1. In order to, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. Oh, that's an exciting uh, couple <laughs> right there. Uh, if you're sitting at home thinking, uh, Ananias is fired. Did I give all my money to the church this week or not? You know, maybe you're thinking about that. For you that don't know, go read Acts chapter five. You'll understand what I'm talking about in a minute. But it, it, the story starts off really back in Acts chapter one. The pastor's been going through and he's been doing a great job in chapter one, two, three, and four. And I, I, I want us to back up a little bit because the book of Acts uh, carries us. It, it just extends our and, and our understanding of how God was developing His church. Mm -hmm. How He started it, Acts chapter one, and then He just continues to develop it along the way. And even today, we're feeling the effects of what they did back then. Yep. Uh, maybe I should say this: What you do as a Christian today will affect you tomorrow. Mm. The decisions you make, each decision we make, has implications for tomorrow. And it also has implications for others around us. That, that's why it's so important, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, what you do on Sunday morning in the worship, I, I just got to tell you, Brad, it, it makes all the difference in the world, whether you're preparing yourself, preparing your heart. We can feel it. We, we understand it. And uh, it takes us to God. It, it really takes us there so that we're prepared to hear from God when the pastor gets up to preach God's word. And when we pray as a body of Christ, that's a powerful prayer because we're in community together. And this is what it was about. It was about a community of people being developed uh, to glorify mm -hmm. God. So we back up um, in Acts chapter one. Let me, let me review for you the scenario. In Acts chapter one, we see and experience, or, or they see and experience the uh, risen Christ and his ascension. Now that's important to understand as we go into this book, um, really, because, you know, there's an expectation they have now. Yeah, They've seen Christ, they've touched him, they've eaten with him, they've talked with him, and then suddenly, zoom, he goes up into heaven off the Mount of Olives. And uh, so that's an experience. You, you ever have an experience where you just 
wow, God was here tonight, you know? Yeah, and well, think about how overwhelming those experiences are when we have those experiences. So can you imagine when he was actually there? Right, <laughs> right. So, and so, it's, well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> he's there, he goes, and the angels tell you what? Get ready, he's coming back yeah. just like he went. Yeah. And, and that's important to understand because as they develop in the book of Acts, they are not just plodding along and, and you know, going along until they die and tolerating things. They're yeah. going along expecting him to come back. That's what they've been told. And so there's a, there's a level of expectation. You know, like we got people all the time say, six, 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 ooh, you know, and, and uh, Bill Gates is putting, uh, what do they call it, uh, a chip in our heads yeah, yeah. through the vaccination and, and all kinds of uh, conspiracy theories. Well, they've been around for a long time. Yeah. But as Christians, it doesn't make Christ any more ready to come than he was back then. We ought to always be on our guard, be on our uh, uh, best behavior because we know the Lord's coming again. Yeah. It, it, that's, that's the motivation for us. So they, they've got an expectation of return. And, and we've seen that in the 1880s, uh, we had the, um, the Bible conference movement. And during that time, the second great awakening was coming about in our country from the formation of our country on. And so there was an anticipation back then, Christ is coming, um, let's get things ready. The Niagara movement, the Bible conference movement. I think you go up to Camp... Uh, Camp of the Woods. Camp yeah. of the Woods. Yeah. What, what, what lake is that on? Speculator. And, and what do they do there every Pleasant. year? What, do you, what kind of things? Hmm. Oh, it, I mean, it's a Christian family camp. I was actually on staff there in the summer of 1997. Where are you? I, didn't, no, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, okay. yeah, I was on staff there. I, I, I actually uh, prayed to receive Christ up there. No kidding. When I was younger. So, so that place has some sacred My uh, favorite place in the world. Yeah. 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 But it's a Bible conference too, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, it's a Christian family camp that we, they bring up different speakers and um, it, it's a great place, though. Yeah, and, and, it, and if you've sets, never been there, you should go. Probably sets the tone as you come back from summer in, into the year as yeah. well. Well, you know, in, in that time, they had the the Methodist had the Chautauqua. I, I think that's how you say it, Chautauqua, yeah. Chautauqua. Maybe I get it right. Uh, camp movement. It's kind of like a TED's <laughs> talk, yeah. and that was around the 1900s. And so there was a movement of people thinking that God was going to come back, and the country's getting better. And better, and of course, we had um, great preachers like uh, Billy Sunday, D.L. Moody, Charles Finney. Um, the temperance movement flowed out of that. And so there's always, when, when we think about Christ coming again, there's always something about that that generates in us a deep, um, a deep uh, desire to walk with God, a deep desire to get things right with God. And so when the apostle Peter cries out, repent and be baptized, you know, yeah. for the remission of your sin. And he's talking about because of the remission of your sin through Christ and what he's done, uh, the people turn to Christ, 3,000 in the first chapter. So it's, it's a great movement going on. The risen savior is exciting in a Roman dominated world too. Because in Rome, you know, everything is the Roman army, the Roman leaders, the government, the coins, everything is Rome. And to the Jews, I mean, it was supposed to be about God reigning through the Jews, and it's just the opposite. Mm -hmm. And so now they've got some excitement going, and Jesus said to watch, be ready for what do you say? For we don't know the hour when he'll return. Each one of us should always run our lives, not because 666 appears, not because the ends of the world type things appear. Because you had World War I, World War II, mm -hmm. you had the Korean War, you had Vietnam War. You've had a lot of things going on in this uh, past hundred years that people thought Jesus has got to come again. It's horrible. Uh, go to Africa now, some of the things that are going on there in those countries and in the Middle East. Every time a bomb explodes, you know, and, and things happen, you could say, oh, Christ has got to return. He doesn't have to return until he's ready. Yep. And he's bringing about things. He's at work in the world. So they're seeing that in chapter one. That's what's going on in chapter one. In chapter two, we have Pentecost. So we have the outpouring of the spirit. The spirit dominates people's lives. And, and by the way, can I stop? Mm -hmm. if, if you've got a question along the way, you can always oh, yeah. send it in. Now, how do they send those questions in? Yeah, so you can just reply to the text message we sent out or uh, the number that's up on the screen for you right now. And you actually don't have to wait till the end, right? No. We're going to do it a little bit differently yeah. today. So as you send them in, we might say, oh, it's actually a question on that. So as we're going through something, feel free to just start sending them in. I'll just ask Brad to answer them anyway. There you go. So, there we go. But the, the, the Pentecost, it's an outpouring of the Spirit. The Spirit dominates people's life. There's a compulsion now in Acts chapter 2. 
They, there's fire on people's heads. Mm -hmm. They're speaking in tongues and languages that no one's ever spoke before. There's a fire in their belly that uh, P uh, Peter, here he is, uh, he, he's cowering. And he, he says, I, I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him three times. Mm -hmm. And he walks away crying because he denied Christ. And all of a sudden, he's the opposite. He's bold. He doesn't care. There's a boldness that comes about. And so there's a total change that we see in Acts chapter 2 of mm -hmm. repentance, boldness, and renewal. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a renewal because people have now have, have hope. And their hope they start to share with one another. They have things in common. That is that uh, I guess you could borrow my lawnmower if you need to or, or uh, come over to the house for something else you need. They're, they're just ready to extend themselves probably because they know Christ is going to return. And they're thinking, we saw him go up on the Mount of Olives, those 120. And, they're think, and they've told a whole pile of people. And they're all saying, you know, Jesus did rise from the dead. So Perhaps he did go up in the clouds and perhaps he'll come back again. So that's dominating in Acts chapter 2. And then Acts chapter 3, Peter begins to be the dominant leader. Now, here in our church, Pastor Ed's the dominant leader. He's been around uh, uh, forever. Uh, you know, <laughs> sorry, Pastor, if you're watching, but uh, he, he's been around a long time. And God's used him in a great way. I mean, we went from Wanta uh, Baptist Church to Living Faith Christian, moved here. Nobody thought about having a 700 seat sanctuary, that's for sure. Um, no one thought, they didn't know how many people would come. I, I don't know, I, I just to let you know, and, and this is a good, good chance for me to insert something right mm -hmm. here. 500, this is amazing to me. Five, during, since we've come back, about six months and two or three weeks, right? Mm -hmm. Since we've been reopened, mm -hmm. uh, having services. 500, I got the number today, 550 first time adult visitors have come to the church. It's amazing. It, it is. It's Did awesome. you ever think you'd see something like that? No. Well, I mean, you know, we, we had conversations in uh, last February, right before the pandemic started at the retreat. Right. Remember there were some conversations because yeah, COVID was just kind of starting, but we weren't shut down yet. And right. It was just kind of barely a blip on the radar. Right. And we said, oh, man, if we had to close the doors of the church, we don't know what would happen. Right. And, yeah, we hadn't and, broadcast it ever before. No. Live. Yeah. And, now here we are, six months after reopening. There's over 500 people that had hadn't been in the building at all before have walked through the doors. So it, praise exactly, God. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, and and I I wonder to myself, how do I get 550 people who uh, have to wear a mask, have to six six feet apart from one another, they have to uh, they have to register, um, then walk in with an usher and get seated in a place and wear a mask all during the service, mm -hmm. you know. And we, we do that. We, we know that probably people could drop them safely while they're sitting down, but we know they're going to stand up and sit down, move around, and, and it's just safer for everybody, and I, I, people feel more comfortable that way. Maybe that's why people are coming, because they feel comfortable Maybe. we've done the right things to protect people and help people. But 550 people ha have, have come, and they're just excited about it. Now, I've got, I, I'll say this too, Brad, I've got 500 members that haven't shown up in six months. And, and I'm, I, I know I've, I've talked to some of them, but I know some of them are you out there. And you said, you know something, Pastor? I had one person tell me, Pastor, I love what you're doing, but. And you know, when you get that but, you're always waiting for the, the, the bad end of it. And uh, the person said to me, but we really like watching at home on our 65 inch screen TV. Uh, we get a cup of coffee, we wait until the afternoon, we watch it, and we actually stop the, the sermon and discuss it a little bit, which is kind of cool to happen. And then they go on and watch the rest of it. And sometimes they have to rewind it because they've never heard what pastor said before explaining the scriptures and they want to hear it again. Or maybe they want to hear the song again that you, you know, the, the band played. So it's some unique things, but let me um, just throw this line at you. If you're sitting at home watching on a 65 inch screen, there's a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ who need your, your presence. I know you probably won't fellowship with many people. I mean, face it, how many people do we each talk to on a Sunday? Well, I talk to a lot of people. I'm moving all the time. Yeah. but You, you get know. to talk to more than yeah, I, I do. do. I'm always running around. And, yeah. uh, but, you know, the average person talks 10 people, maybe, at a, at a, on, a, on a Sunday at, at length. But, you know, something, there's something about the presence of the body of Christ. Being able to look across the room and say, there's one of the elders, there's one of the the volunteers who does children. There's one of the, the people who work with my teenager. And, you know, and, and I grew up in church. You did too. 
we need to, we need to see those leaders as kids. I, I need to know that church is valuable in people's lives, the presence of believers. There's something about when we pray together corporately, um, we, we gain uh, the power of God. He, he says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'll hear them. There's, that's important. So if you're sitting at home, uh, you don't have to come back every week, although we'd like to have you. Um, come back sometime and register on a weekend. You'll get in here and, uh, and you'll enjoy it. Uh, Brad and the band have just done a, a marvelous job. Can I say that to you? I appreciate just, it. Thank you. Just all, all the glory to God, though. Yeah, but every time you have a new singer each week or somebody else playing the guitar or something, it's sweet. It, it really is good. And, but it's encouraging. And so I just want to stop for a moment, challenge you. Love to have you on the screen. I think the screen has allowed us to go all over the island and all over the world, you yeah. know. To and, and, you know, I guess the worship is different when we do it together, too. It is. So. It is. You know. Yeah. Um, that's great. But it also, yes, the, the, the live stream is a great tool for us to, to share with people, right? Those 500 plus people came through the door because somebody shared it with them online. Right. Oh, that's right. Right. So yeah, that's, it's our front door now. They yeah. see that first and then they come through. And by the way, I think it was, there's 550 adults. There's over a hundred first time children that have come in addition to that. So a lot of new faces, a lot of new people, uh, but we'd like to see some of those old people too. So if you're sitting at home and there's no reason not to come, jump in the car, uh, make yourself known. But you know, they, they got excited. Acts chapter two, uh, there's renewal among them. Acts chapter three, uh, Peter becomes, like I said, Peter's now prominent. He's the voice. He's the healer. Uh, later, we're going to see in Acts chapter five, uh, after the passage, I'm going to just talk about a little bit tonight. He actually is walking down the street and people are trying to get in his shadow. That's pretty cool that, that you've got that kind of reputation. Now, there's nothing that tells me his shadow actually saved, you know, healed people of cancer and gave him power to walk and all the rest. But there's something about uh, his reputation the re and because his reputation was that which represented the Savior, Christ, who changed his life. And it's always unique. You can imagine Peter, uh, I, don't, I never read it this way, but I'll bet he had to tell people occasionally, I was a coward at one point, mm -hmm. but Christ changed me. And, and that's the power of Christ. He will change you completely. If you're watching tonight, and you haven't received Christ as Savior, you said, you know, I know all about him, but I've just never taken that step of faith where the flip the switch and say, I want Christ as my Savior. I'm declaring myself to follow him. Um, when you flip that switch, that switch really goes on. And there's a power, uh, an element found within the saving grace of Christ that just changes you. So th that, that goes on, and Peter is now uh, the voice. They meet at Solomon's colonnade, it says in Acts chapter 3. Now, the, the colonnade was... Um, they always would go to the temple to meet. They didn't have churches. They didn't have buildings. They would, they, they're Jewish. They can go to the temple. So they, they go into the, just outside the women's court, Solomon's uh, colonnade. It's probably the last part standing of the, the, the temple from Solomon's time. And um, the, it's overlooking the Kidron Valley on the east side of, of um, the temple. And so they're gathered there, hundreds of them. Uh, and they're teaching. They're sharing about their faith, listening in probably singing some songs as well, uh, no doubt. Um, but they're looking at the Kidron Valley, and you know what they're seeing? They're seeing the Mount of Olives mm. out there. Now, that's pretty significant. Yeah. The fact is, is that it says here in Acts chapter 3, they met in, this, in the Solomon's colonnade, and then in Acts chapter 5, they also continued to meet there. So it probably was the area that the Jewish leaders put up with them and let them mm -hmm. meet over there. But it was also the place where they could, every time they gathered, they look across the valley and they see that Mount of Olives. What was it? It was where Christ ascended into heaven. And they're waiting for the return of Christ. There is a constant renewal of their faith as they think about what Christ has done for them and then Christ coming again. Hmm. You can, we don't think about that too much, do we, really? I mean, let's face it. Uh, I didn't drive down the road today saying, where, where is he? Is he coming here? Is he coming there? Um, there's a cloud opening. Maybe it's through there. We don't do that very much. I, I think they yeah. did that. To be honest, sometimes as Christians, we spend too much time trying to figure out when and probably not enough time mm -hmm. just using that sense of urgency yeah. to live as he called us to that day, right? Right. No, no doubt about it. We're, 
we're consumed with consuming. Yeah. And sometimes we're just consumed <laughs> with Islanders games. It's an Islanders fan <laughs> or Yank. Well, we're both Yankees I'm, I'm, fans. We're too. both Yankees fans, but That's we're just quiet about it right <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah, right now it's tough. Okay. Um, and if you're not a baseball fan, you don't get that. The others sure do. Um, so they're meeting in Sol Solomon's Colonnade. They're facing the Mount of Olives. They're anticipating mm -hmm. Christ coming again. And it's the area of the women's court. So you know what that kind of indicates, too, is that the Christians gravitated toward being inclusive with the women. There, there's something about that just appeals to me to say they, they weren't just setting over there, all the men over on this side and the women on this side. And there may have been some of that going on, but certainly... Uh, they were identifying down with the people already. They, they weren't with the elitist uh, yeah. there in the temple. Um, and then um, it, it, they, they shared. It says they, they, they shared and they shared with one another. That, that's something cool. They, they were constantly not only telling others about Christ, but they were also sharing in their goods, in the things that they would bring in and, and, and hand them out. You know, when I think about sharing, though, you know I'm an evangelist. It, it took me a long time. It took me Ed Kirkland to tell me one day, he says, you're just an evangelist, admit it. Because it, it, what I don't like is when they, people say, Pastor Mark, you're an evangelist, so therefore you're the one to do the evangelism, not me. That's what I feel like <laughs> yeah. they're saying. Yeah. And, and I know they aren't, but, they, but I am an evangelist. I just love to tell others about Christ. Brad, now you were... You were um, with a big flower shop online. <laughs> I'm just, you know, if you want to say it, you can. Yeah. Um, but you, you were the marketing manager. Uh -huh. um, so tell me, what, what do you see from marketing online? Let's not use the term marketing, sharing online that people could do about their faith, because I think there's some opportunities there. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the world has opened up, right, years ago. 20 years ago, you had to go up to someone, you know, when I was in college, I was in, you know, it's called Crew now, but it's Campus Crusade ah, back great. then, right? Yep. And Good group. And you'd, you'd have to go and speak to someone face-to-face. -face. You'd have to find those people. That was your whole sphere of influence, right? Who you could right. get to physically. Um, now you can you can reach anyone across the world, pretty much. Hmm. So the opportunities there to reach people at, a, at greater numbers. Um, but also, without... I think it's important to share things on social media. You know, it's also important to to understand what you're sharing, mm. right? So be cognizant of just because somebody shared something, don't just be like, yep, I agree, and share it without looking at it first or things like no. that, but, you know, because you see I've a lot of that, that going on. But, um, you know, we we even put our services, our 1015 service goes live on, live on Facebook. Okay. And under that, there's a share button right there uh -huh. on the bottom right. You All hit right. share. And everybody that's friends with you on Facebook is now, you know, has the opportunity to maybe see some of our service on a Sunday morning and hear the gospel, and maybe they wouldn't. Um, but a, another great thing is that how we act online mm. should be in line mm. with how Christ calls us to live our lives. And when people see that, they'll say, there's something different about that person, mm. right? So then when you share something like our church service or, or, or a Bible verse or something on, on your social media or online. Um, yeah. they're, they're open to hearing what you have to say because they've already seen the difference that Christ has made in your life. Right? Yeah, you know, I'm afraid to, to say that I've seen on Facebook all too often um, foul language mm -hmm. by Christians, um, you know, political statements that rub everybody the wrong way. You know, I mean, it's one thing to say, I believe this. It's another to ram it down somebody's throat in a nasty way. Um, be belligerent. That's the word. Belligerent. Uh, angry. Come across angry. Um, Jesus, you know, you know, we're told in the scriptures, John says, they'll know you um, by what? The, by your fruit. Yeah. They'll know you by your love. Yeah, they'll know you love. by your compassion for people. So it's important for us to share in a way. As an evangelist, I always, you know, try to listen to people long enough to hear their story and then to be able to fit that story, uh, help them uh, understand their story and how it fits into the gospel or how the gospel fits into their story and try to pull them along and show them the love of Christ and, mm. and how God had so much care for each one of us. And I think sometimes we push people away. Mm. And, and really it's hard to make that up, isn't it, online yeah. sometimes. Um, once you've said something, hard to pull back. How many, how many politicians erase their Twitter <laughs> statements, right, yeah. all the time? Just things they've said. Somebody always catches a screenshot first, though, right? Yeah. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I always like the fact that you can go to our website and you can go lfcc.org slash and get some things. So like baptism, mm -hmm. if, if you've never seen the baptism page that Bobby did, oh my word, mm -hmm. that is a phenomenal piece of work that he did. So uh, go to lfcc.org slash baptism and then pull that page up. You can share that kind of stuff mm -hmm. with your friends. They're great stories about changed lives. Um, and it, and it, they got a, a teaching time on there yeah. for learning what baptism's about. Just good stuff, yeah. um, but sharing with people. And then, you know something, doing it on the web, there's nothing offensive about it either. It's just what I saw. Mm -hmm. That's what I always tell people. The best way mm -hmm. you can share your faith is simply to say, hey, I saw this. Hey, God did this in my life. I don't have to say, hey, Brad, you know you need something here, yeah. you know, because now I'm now I'm pushing pretty yeah. hard. But people always appreciate hearing a good story. Yeah. And uh, so they were telling their story everywhere they went. Chapter 4 goes on, and all of a sudden now we're in Chapter 4 where Pastor was last week, and the persecution from the Jews starts in, mm. and uh, the leaders. And, it, and, he, and he mentions uh, Pilate, and he mentions Herod, how they conspired together. But it was really, he says, you Jewish leaders, he tells them, um, the high priest and his associates that really stirred up things and really um, got Christ um, uh, sentenced to death. And Herod and Pilate just went along with them for the ride because they, mm -hmm. they had no choice in the matter. But uh, in Acts chapter 4, um, the Romans aren't the big threat. Now they they are the big threat to the religious leaders. And, and, and I would say this to you. If you don't know how to share your faith, sometimes you just got to understand it's... it's it's going to be threatening to people. It does impose a challenge because as soon as they hear the gospel, they know they're sinners. As soon as somebody hears, you know, I was an alcoholic and Christ saved me. If you're an alcoholic, you, you just got told that you need to be saved, all right? So there's a pushback that's coming. Uh, Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. Expect it. So there, there's just no getting around uh, some of that at all. So they get uh, pushback now, but they are bold they are defiant, Peter and his associates. I'm calling them that. Some were apostles and some were just regular uh, volunteers and the normal Christians there. Uh, they're defiant and they're supported by the people every day. So um, they're uh, taken to jail, put in jail, they get released. Um, the elders can't figure out, the Pharisees can't figure out how they got released. Um, but they're released now and they're pretty defiant about it. But the people were with them. So the Pharisees and Sadducees and all didn't know what to do with them. Uh, they were having a hard time with it there in chapter 4. But in, in verse 30, so we, we go to Acts chapter 4 in verse 30, um, it, it says this. It says um, he, he's, he's uh, appealing to the Lord and uh, Peter, and he, and he says, Now stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. That text right there, these are Old Testament believers. You have to realize that there's no New Testament yet. They, they are saying, God, would you do what you did for Moses? Mm. Stretch out those hands and um, do the plagues or part the waters. And in this case, he wants healing um, and he wants to see signs and wonders. Mm. And so there's a confidence that God is with them and they're boldly identifying with Moses. And so their identification with Moses only stirs the people up more. They see the signs, the miracles, and then the Pharisees are sitting back going, uh-oh, these people are with them, and we got a big problem coming. Um, so let me ask. Yeah. Um, so one, one question that actually came in, so I'll, I'll pass it on to you. So when we're talking about boldness, how can that relate to us today, right? They were able to be bold because, as you said, they had seen, you know, Jesus and... Um, they were looking out at the Mount of Olives, but um, how can we have the confidence to be bold or um, what does that mean for us today? In what ways are we called to be bold? Um, well, there's a couple of thoughts that come to my mind maybe. Uh, boldness is something we develop. It, it's, it's not, you just can't mm. suddenly turn the lights on and go, I'm bold, yeah. you know, I'm a tough guy uh, because it's a, it's a tough world out there. You can be persecuted pretty bad. You can be told you're going to be fired. You can be told to shut your mouth. You can be, uh, your neighbors can hate you. Um, your relatives can hate you for the gospel. Mm -hmm. R realize that this is going to come against you. So what I always say to do is you got to gather around other believers and number one, see how they're walking with the Lord. Get encouraged by them. That's why I'm telling you to come to church. Hmm. 
It, it, it just encourages you. You see so many people. I, I, can't, I can't tell you how many times somebody has come up to me after a service who's a visitor and said, wow, I had no idea this church. There's a lot of people here. It impresses them. And, and what happens is when we get around other believers, we learn how they've been emboldened. We learn how they've gone through trials and tribulations. We learn how they've uh, fought battles. And we also learn that God supports them and holds them. Test the Lord, try him and see if he's good and, and let him prove himself out in your life. So I say, you gotta get around other believers. You gotta read God's word. Because if you don't know God's word, you're, you're up the creek. I mean, somebody's gonna say to you, we're in the Bible. You don't know where, Old or New Testament. Um, memorize God's word. Uh, read it, learn it, um, study it, go on the web, listen to some guys. Uh, YouTube's full of it, right? You got all kinds of people who preach the word of God and some great speakers there to listen to. So I would say that boldness is something you're gonna learn, but it's also coming out of your spirit as the spirit of God just yeah. strikes at your heart. You've been forgiven. You, you've been cleansed. You've been renewed. You've been given hope when there's no hope, you know? I think of how many families I've met. I lost my son. They lost their children. They lost their mom. They lost their dad. Uh, but they have hope that they can see him again. I, I've met so many families that don't know the Lord. You know what hope they've got? None. It, it, they're, they're not yeah. challenged to be bold about anything because they have no hope. We have hope and we have peace with God. I go to bed tonight knowing God's forgiven me, knowing that I will see my son in heaven one day. Mm. Boom. He's not a little bird. He, weird stuff comes out of theology here on the yeah. island. Uh, been to some funerals that are just weird stuff. And he's not a little bird. He doesn't become an angel. He is who he is. I'm looking forward to seeing him again. Mm. Looking forward to seeing my mom, my dad. I know I'm forgiven. I know that if I die, I'm going to be with the Lord. There, there's something that emboldens me to tell people, I got something you don't have. Um, I, I'm one beggar showing another beggar where to find bread, but boy, I got good bread. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I long answer to it. Yeah, no, Short good, good answer there. though. Um, so if you expect God to move, it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Ask him to move. So yeah. a lady comes, she's leaving church on Sunday morning with a lady behind the counter. She comes out and she says this, I asked God, I don't know if it was that morning or Saturday night, God, would you use me? Mm -hmm. And uh, on Sunday morning, she led a visitor who had come to, Christ, to, to church. She led her to Christ prayed with her to receive the Lord out in the lobby. Uh, you know how many times I've said, God, would you give me a soul? Give me somebody to witness to. Give me somebody to share with. And out of the blue, I shouldn't say out of the blue, God just supplies that because um, my heart is ready. I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to see what he'll do. And uh, so if you expect God to move, ask God to move in your life and he will empower you. And so their expectations keep growing. That's what Acts chapter four is about. Um, and it says in Acts chapter 4, 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. That's what I'm telling you. If you can make it to church, <laughs> well, you do shake it a little bit here yeah. with the, the base and everything yeah. else. But, um, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Can't get away from that in Acts chapter uh, 4, verse 31. Then all, then all the believers, they began to uh, be one in heart a lot of things began to change. Ch starting in Acts chapter four, verse 32 says, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. No one, they had plenty. From and that, and that's pretty important in a time when you're you know you're, you're living off bare land back then you know, farming yeah. type uh, situation from uh, for from time to time those who owned land or houses sold them brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone who had need this is important this is leading up to Acts chapter five and then Joseph a Levite from Cyprus whom the apostles called Barnabas which means sons of encouragement. Sold a, field, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, no one else prior to this time had their name mentioned like that who had given um, 
property or other things. But we know that other things had been given yeah. and distributed to the apostles. So let me just go over a couple of things that that said because it's going to set the tone for Acts chapter 5 and what we're about to read. Be because the story in Acts chapter 5 is pretty quick, um, what happens with Ananias and Sapphira. But leading up to it helps us understand what exactly happened. So there, there, it says there they were one in heart and mind. Um, they, you know, I, I've never heard a... A unity message. Have you ever heard a message on the unity in the body of Christ? I've heard a lot of different messages. I don't, no, I never have either. Um, but you know, it was Christ's prayer. In John chapter 17, he says this, I pray for them that they be of one mind. And he, he talks about that in John chapter 17. He prays to the Father, oh, make them one as, as we are one. Right. So when I think about what it means to be, get this mic right, get what it means to be as one. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were one from all eternity past. They never disagreed. They walked together. They had the same objectives, same goals, same vision, same desires, same right and wrong, same moral things. They just, they were holy. And, and so now he's saying that in John chapter 17, I want them to be one as we are one. Now you think about that. In the local church today, could we say the church is unified? Mm and one as Christ and the Father are one. So when we have disagreements, which we will, mm -hmm. because we're, we're growing, we're learning. Now, Christ and the Father, they, did, they didn't grow. They didn't learn like that. They, they were one from all eternity in the past. I can't even begin to understand that. Yeah. But, it, but it, that's the way it was. And so we have to learn. We have to experience. We grow through our sin. We shed some of that sin, hopefully, along the way. Um, we deal with temptations um, that are hard on us because they come right at the heart of things. And so we, we struggle with some of that. Mm -hmm. But his prayer is that they'll be unified and, and unity will advance the faith. That's what's happening here. Chapters one, two, three, and four, they're unified. They've got it together. They're moving forward all the way. There's nothing prohibiting them and stopping them. And, and may I say this? You may have a particular doctrine that you just like to ride. You're a Calvinist. And man, it's just God elected and that's it. And on the other hand, you're a free willer. You just say, man, I'm an Arminian and I, I just think everybody has to have a chance the way I see it. Um, <laughs> you know, if you're going to run that, that direction, you're going to plow hard against another believer and instead of trying to come together and let us reason together as the Lord wants us to with him, come together and work it out and say, we're going to work on this issue until we glorify God, until we can come together and, and recognize this great truth. I, um, you know, I'm, I, I hold to a certain doctrine on the, on the book of Revelation and how it's going to work out. I'm pretty uh, steady on that. But you know something? There are some believers who disagree with me on that. So, but I know that when Christ comes again, it's over anyway. Yeah. For us, we're going up. So maybe, maybe we need to work on that together and put aside some things and focus on the real issue. The real mm -hmm. issue is Christ came and he died for our sins and he rose again and he's trying to redeem people. There are lost, too many lost people in the world to get tied up on whether they're one of the elect or not or they're, they have a free will mm -hmm. or whether they're, they go to hell forever or 99 years plus and all the, the, those those are important doctrines to discuss because they work out uh, how we view God and how we think of God the holiness of God and how we respect it but boy we we've got to focus in on what's important major on the majors play down on the minors you know and but they're one heart one mind they're they're not playing around with it they they know what's important there are too many lost people around them they're, they're going to win the loss to Christ. They're thriving as a community now. And um, that, that unity is built around doctrine, just what I was talking about a minute ago, and the gospel. Um, and so they're all going in the same direction. They've got the same theology. It's Christ. He rose again. We're looking over at the Mount of Olives. We don't know when he's coming back again, but man, we're on target. We're going to walk holy because when he comes again, I don't want to be found drunk. I don't want to be found with my Facebook pages contaminated with foul language. Uh, you, you, I could go on. The list can go on, can it? Yeah. I, I don't want to see, have him find me hurting people with just unkindness, mm -hmm. lack of love. God, reform me. 
<laughs> That's the attitude. That's the theology they had yeah. uh, going on. And then they had a vision. So they centered on the gospel. They had a vision and it was the same. They were pushing it out. I think there are a couple things that hurt unity. And maybe I wanna, I wanna say these, I wrote them down here. Um, some things that hurt unity, uh, a personal agenda. We can get caught up in a personal agenda, right? Mm -hmm. Um, people, I'll bet people want certain songs sung, right? You're, you're <laughs> the musician here. Yeah. Um, so they, they got a personal agenda yeah. on a Sunday. Um, and, then, and then you've got um, cynicism. I know that no one in New York is very cynical, uh, but, you know, <laughs> when, I, when I came to New York, they told me, boy, New York is a real cynical. I'm a New Yorker by birth, so I'm back home. And um, yeah, we are. That's all there is to it, <laughs> yeah. right? And, and that hinders unity uh, because we're always questioning everybody's motives instead of just saying, God bless you. I look forward to what God's going to do in your life. Um, there, there's temptation and sin. We, we fall to temptation instead of recognizing that there's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow us to be tempted above what we are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that we may be able to bear it. That doesn't mean we aren't gonna have some harder temptations than someone else, mm -hmm. but it means that every temptation that God brings into our life, God can overcome as we yield to the work of the Spirit in our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. I memorized that when I was 12 years old. Yeah. I can still do it. Nice. Isn't that cool? Yeah. I'm glad. I'm not trying to brag about it. I'm just thrilled that yeah. God would lay that into me just to use yep. in a message like this. And so I think it's important for us to understand that unity can be hindered if we yield to temptation and sin. Before we move on to Ananias and Sapphira, yeah. and we're talking about what can cause the division um, within the church and, and break up our unity, a good question came in about disagreements and how can I disagree with someone in a loving way, right? How do we, you talked about the things that can cause the division, but how can we go about those disagreements in a loving way? Um, if, if it's a believer, assuming it's a believer. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the greatest things we can do is pray together. Mm. And, and you can stop and be the bigger person if you have to be and say, you know something? I really want to prove to you I'm right, but why don't we pray? Why don't we pray for something that we know we're agreement upon that God is at work in? Uh, we refocus ourselves on Christ so much so that we take upon ourselves the form of a servant, which Christ did, and we humble ourselves. That's what it says in Philippians chapter two. We humble ourselves just as Christ humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. If Christ was willing to do that for me, how dare, how dare I offend a brother or sister in Christ who Christ died for? Now, I don't think of it that much because I get caught up in it. And so we have to back off and, and say to ourselves, number one, maybe I'm not right. You know, I mean, I might, yeah. rare, but I might not be right about something. I'm always right, so I don't know anything yeah. about okay. that. Okay, that's what Carrie says anyway, <laughs> yeah. right. Um, but yeah, I, I think we need to see each other as fellow, fellow people who are made in God's image. I always say that at a wedding. I say, remember, you're marrying somebody just like you, made in God's image, who has fallen. <laughs> that means you're a sinner. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you're made in God's image. We all are. Even lost people have that reflection of Christ or, or God, who is Christ, in them. They, they know in their heart they're not right. They know in their heart that they're sinners. Romans chapter one and two tells us that it's written in their hearts. Mm -hmm. That's why they, everyone knows, every atheist knows it's wrong to murder. Well, if atheism is true and there is no right and wrong at the end of the game, I don't know how murder is always wrong, but they know it's wrong. They know stealing is wrong. There's something written within us, God says. Mm. And so we have to fall back on that. And if Christ died for that person, then I should be willing to care for them that much, never to offend them as we go along. Um, so we, we need to appreciate, <laughs> that was my final point. We need to appreciate others and the work of God in their mm -hmm. life. And so how do we, what unifies us? The gospel unifies us the work and activity of the Holy Spirit unifies us. Nothing better than to say, wow, God's at work in that person's life. Wow, I wanna be partner with them in the gospel. And then fulfillment of the Great Commission. Um, last Friday night, I led two people to the Lord, uh, young people, younger uh, couple. And it was exciting 
I, I just knew God was there. And when I told some people about it, they were shouting amen <laughs> because it unifies us. Pulls The gospel pulls us together. And the Great Commission, uh, which is... Um, which is the call for us to go out into the world and make disciples of Christ. And then um, the care that we have for one another. I think it's important for us mm -hmm. to care. And they were doing that all through these scriptures. They were caring for one another. And the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, kindness. Th those are the type of things that are going to unify us and pull us together. And a matter of fact, my arguments kind of go downhill as soon as I start thinking about love, joy, peace, long mm -hmm. Long suffering, and it means putting up with another person, and um, until God changes them, or maybe me too. So these are important. They were of one heart, one mind. Their desires were the same. They were inclusive. They had the rich, they had the poor. Um, the passage just tells us that as we go on. Some people were wealthy. They brought even the land in that they sold and, and gave the proceeds of it to the church, and, and others were receiving that money. So they had the rich and the poor with them at the same time. And, and then their heart desire and in Psalm 139 or verses 23 and 24, it says, search me, O God, and know my heart, test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Their heart desire was bent toward following God, moving away from themselves. And then their mind was bent on him in Romans chapter 12, verses one and two. Now see if I can memorize this right. I better get ready for that. Um, it says, therefore, um, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, present yourselves a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not transformed by the um, transformed by the re but be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is the acceptable and pleasing will of God. Mm -hmm. We're to let our our mind go where Christ wants us to go. And, and change that mind. Um, we're sinners. We're born anew when we come in to know Christ. We got a lot of learning to do. And as we learn God's word, it changes us and it changes the way we walk. And then finally, um, we got a guy or, like Barabbas uh, who comes in, well, Barnabas who Barnabas. comes in. I got to get it right. Yeah. Barabbas is another yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. I don't want that one. Um, but he comes in and he's transformed. He, he's got the new priorities. He's sharing uh, he wants his wealth distributed. He's a Levite, by the way. The Levites weren't supposed to own land. Mm. Uh, they were supposed to trust in the gifts yeah. from the people. And he's from Cyprus. So somehow he's probably been shipped away for some reason. He's on the island of Cyprus, which became the first place of the first missionary trip. So mm. this is a setup for it. Because yep. this guy, the guy of encouragement, Paul's going to go with him. And um, so now he comes along. He sells his field because he's been transformed by the power of God. Um, and, and, you know, they're doing evangelism. They, they want, he lays the money at the feet of the apostles. He didn't designate his gifts. How about that? We, we don't have designated gifts too much here at our church and try not to because, you know, we want to give it freely to wherever God might have a need. And he just says, what, what's it needed for? And, um, so he's doing these things, and no one gets much recognition except this guy, and um, he trusted it to the apostles. Now, that's pretty unique. Today, we would say, hey, we don't want the pastors handling the money, and, and we don't because we, we don't hear at this church, and the reason is, is because we, we just don't want a reputation damaged by an accusation, even though it may not be true. And, but they gave the, the funds to the apostles, put them at their feet, and they distributed them. Later in Acts chapter 7, we see that they distribute them through the deacons, uh, the funds, and help people. But Barnabas' name gets dropped here uh, because he's a, he's a kind guy and, and he's an encourager. He builds people up. Um, in Proverbs 19, 17, it says, he who is kind to the poor will be rewarded. Now, I want you to note this. Barnabas, his name is synonymous with an encourager for the last 2,000 years. Mm. How's your name going to be used next week, the week after? When you're gone, will people be saying, hey, remember Mark, remember Brad, remember Rick, Steve, and Susie? Or will they be saying, oh, you remember Rick, Steve, or Susie? I had a guy in my church up in Maine where I grew up. He fell into a paper machine and died. 
He was in his 20s. He had been a Christian six months. He was the town drunk. He ran around with women, had a wife, kids, and it was well noted. But when he came to Christ, his life radically changed. And here's what happened to him. Um, he died 10 years later. I'm sitting in the home. I've been witnessing to a guy in the paper mill. So I went to visit him, an older man. He and his wife were sitting there. And all of a sudden, she leaned forward and she says, that Carrie Thomas, I don't buy it. I don't believe it. And I'm thinking, oh no, did I not know something about Carrie Thomas? He must've done something awful. And, and I said, what, what was the problem with Carrie Thomas? And she said this, I don't believe anybody can be a town drunk, run around on his wife, cheat and be that evil and suddenly be that good. It just doesn't make sense to me. Mm. His, his reputation, Christ had so changed his life. 10 years later, I'm able to witness more effectively because of what Christ has done. May, may I stop right now? Ask God, can I say this to all of us? Let's be Barnabas. Let's be the kind of guy that leaves behind a reputation wherever we go, the shop, the co among coworkers, um, out at the gas station, wherever we are, be the kind of people that they just say, wow, that's the kind of people we want to be. My dad was kind of that way. My dad was just, he'd witness everywhere he went. I had a great dad. I, I, and, and dads, be that kind of dad to your kids. Be the kind of dad that they look back and say, my dad walked with God and it just drew me in. Well, uh, Barnabas was that kind of person. My dad was that kind of guy. He, he and the pastor, another man, led 66 people to Christ his first six months of being saved. They just went nuts on Ticonderoga, New York. Church filled up, people everywhere. He started a youth group. They, they bought him a bus to haul the kids around. It, there were so many kids. And back then, we used to stand on the bus aisles, you know, and all. We mm -hmm. didn't have that seat belt around <laughs> us, the old millennials. And Well, sorry, guys. Don't mean to say that to you and the, the Gen Z and all. But um, my dad was that way. And he used to sing hymns. He'd walk around the paper mill, and, and uh, guys used to mock him down. But he loved to sing hymns. He became known as the... The preacher, the guy who sung hymns. Did you ever have a hymn? Now, you're, you're leading contem more contemporary music. Yeah. Do you have some hymns that you like, Brad? Um, oh, I do. Um, well, if you've been to Camp of the Woods, you know I love there's a song to be sung to the nations. Mm. People that have gone to Camp of the Woods will know why. I know but, that song. Um, all, hail, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Okay. All right. Um, praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the, the King, King of, of creation. creation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, those, I guess those are probably three of my favorites. Those are good ones. I'm, I'm from a Baptist background, so it's, it's the national anthem, Victory in Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Everybody, every, every third Sunday, every second Sunday, Victory in Jesus came about. Hey, let me, ask, let me ask you, what, if you've been around a while, maybe you know a hymn that somebody else sang, your mom, your dad, or you just mm -hmm. enjoy, why don't you text it in right now? We're going to see what the number one song will be. How's that? <laughs> yeah, that sounds At the good. end of our time together. Just a few more minutes together. But yeah. we want to jump on uh, this about Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah, let's do that. We got a man, and we turn to Acts chapter 5. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. So he's contrasting it to Barnabas in the chapter before, and that's why I want to lay that about out for us. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, uh, uh, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposable, disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. This is a New Testament reality, not an Old Testament one. We like to think of Jesus as what? Loving, good, kind. God is out there for us. He's in our camp. Everything's going to come down hunky-dory. And he dies for lying to God. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then, and it doesn't say everyone heard at that point, all who heard. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen. The feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, 
and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Verse 11, great fear. I, I would imagine that's an understatement. Mm-hmm. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Um, boy, that's, that's pretty tough. Well, talk about a sense of urgency. We were talking about prior to that, there was a sense of urgency. Now you can imagine. Oh, yeah. Get right with God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Matter of fact, um, maybe I'll bring in some more money uh, on top of the promise that I had already made, right? There's uh, something's gone on. Mm -hmm. So it it says in the scriptures, a good name is better than riches. Now they've destroyed their name. Um, We've got names like, when you think of Adam and Eve, what do you think of? You think of the fall of man. Mm -hmm. Uh, When you think of the name of Cain, killed his brother, right? You got Abraham, who lied twice about his wife, that it really wasn't his wife. We've got Jacob's sons. And what do they do? They sell off his, their brother mm-hmm. off to Egypt, which, of course, God used in a good way yeah. later on, but it didn't have to go down that way. Yeah. Um, Achan, he stole the items in Jericho uh, when they took the city, and uh, he died. His whole family died. And then Jezebel, when we think of Jezebel, what a, what a name. You don't name your daughter Jezebel. I've got a daughter, a granddaughter on the way, excited, July 3rd, going to be a cool time. But... Uh, I don't think they're going to name her Jezebel. And because uh, these are names that just go with evil, go with bad things because of what they did, the life they lived. Can you imagine having the name Nixon? What are you thinking about? Watergate. Forever. Yep. Nixon opened up China to America, opened up a relationship. And no, we're not thinking about that first. We think about Watergate. And what, what if you were in Germany and your last name was Hitler? Um, I, I think you're going to be changing your name pretty quick. So their names now go down. We got Barnabas, whose name goes forward as the encourager. We've got these guys, their names just go down in the sewer, and you don't want anything to do with uh, Ananias and Sapphira because they lied to God. The the storyline was that they probably had an extra piece of land because they needed a place um, to live, and so they sell it. There's no compulsion in the passage. That's what he's trying to say to them. Why didn't you just tell us? You didn't have to give us the whole thing, but now you've lied to us. You've deceived us. So it would be like somebody in the congregation coming forward on a Sunday morning, standing in front of everybody. Why, pastors, I, I uh, sold this, this big, uh, uh, I don't know, a Lamborghini, 100,000 bucks. And it'd probably be more than that, wouldn't it, probably? But uh, I want to give the money to the church now. So everybody gets to see them. Their name is, they're puffed up and, Everybody's going to respect them now, but actually they lied. And that's what it was like. And you can imagine uh, on a Sunday morning, everybody pours into here. They're all excited. They've seen each other. They're, they're praying. Some people praying together. I see them in the audience. I see uh, uh, people singing, praising God. And all of a sudden, somebody drops dead from lying in the midst of it. You can mm-hmm. only imagine the deafening effect that that uh, must have had uh, among the believers there when that took place. But um, you know, he mentions here that it, it was uh, Satan. Uh, he says, why has, have you allowed Satan into this situation? I mean, it wasn't just a, a matter of, of them uh, doing this, but Satan filled their heart, it says. And there are many things that pull us away because he's the father of deceit. He's the father of lies. And see, that's what the apostle's tying this to. He, he may not have been certain that Satan was there, but the father of lies is the one who has created an environment for us to yield to that temptation. Many things pull us away. The Bible says the world, the flesh, the devil. He says in James 4, 7, flee the devil and he'll, and, and flee the devil and he'll flee from you. Um, draw nigh unto the Lord, he'll draw nigh to you. So they did the opposite. They just started thinking about these things. And may I say to you this, I think that's what happens. Sin seeps in and it just starts flooding in sooner or later. You got to nip it in the bud sooner or later and say, God, every day, God, I want to repent of whatever it was yesterday. God, I want to change my heart toward you. Start off the day right, clean and ready to serve Christ. But they got pulled in. Um, You know, I asked my dad, hey, dad, um, what if we didn't tithe? I mean, would we have lived better? I mean, we do, we do better than most. I was, I was out in front of the house one day. I remember it as a kid. My dad said, oh, no, Mark. He says, I tithe and God has blessed me beyond what those neighbors have. I know they don't tithe. They don't even go to church, he said. 
Uh, but God has blessed me. I live no different than them. You ever notice that sometimes? Mm -hmm. Isn't it baffling how we can give to the Lord and the world doesn't seem to get ahead any more than, than we do? Yeah. They probably got a lot of debt somewhere hidden too, right? But um, God, God has still cleansed our hearts, removed things, and blessed us in so many ways. And um, so uh, there's an old statement, statement I wanted to just give to you, and it's, it goes something like this. Sin will keep you from the book, or the book will keep you from sin. Re may I challenge you, read God's word yeah. daily. Brad, uh, what do you think distracts us most from reading God's word sometimes? Um, well, life can be distracting, but it's priorities probably, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, could you imagine if your boss said, hey, I want you to have that report on my desk every morning by 9.30 mm -hmm. in the morning, and you just mm -hmm. said, uh, I won't worry about it today, right? When the expectation is you're going to have that there for him. We prioritize that, right? We make sure that gets done. Right. But uh, a lot of times we don't end... I think sometimes it's probably, you know, it says that we're, we're to grow in maturity. Mm -hmm. And when we're younger, it's that parent-child relationship yeah. that we have with God, right? When you're younger, you go, uh, I, and you, you might blow your parents off and go, ah, uh, I'll yeah. do that later. And then sometimes as you get older, you get more mature, you realize how valuable that relationship was. Right. And that time that you didn't spend was lost time. Right. Right. And that happens as, as you grow more mature. So, so I think it's probably a lack of maturity as well. Mm. Okay. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take that and run with that beginning next week. Yeah. All right. And in the meantime, I just want to hold up and show you something. I know we're over just by a minute. And um, it, it's, it's the Bible I use every day, the one year Bible. And it's, it's got a, it starts out with a, an Old Testament passage. Um, then a New Testament passage. It's got a psalm and it's got a proverb uh, every day. And then here's the next day, April 7th on this page. And it just keeps you walking through the Bible. And, you know, I, I would encourage you, uh, get some system down where you're reading God's word and allowing him to protect you from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Otherwise, you're going to succumb to it and it's going to change your heart, your life, and move you away from God. Don't be Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, move in a different direction. We're going to add more to that next week. Uh, we're going to stop right there yeah. conveniently. Before, because... before we close up, too, oh, yeah. I just want some of the hymns. Oh, yeah, the hymns. I might as that. well tell you. So we got a, a, a bunch of How Great Thou Art. Okay. Was right? that the number one? Uh, I think so. Okay. Um, in the Garden, a couple of people said, In the Garden, um, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. Um, an amazing grace, of course. So those were, I, I think, the most common ones that were sent in. Cool. But yeah, thanks right. for sending them in. Yeah. I'll, I'll have to uh, come up with one or two versions of those. Yeah, you'll we'll rearrange soon. the song yeah, make yeah, it, we'll, so the band we'll can do, play We'll do a version. That'll, That'll be, be cool. good. That'll be cool. <laughs> hey, we want to thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, read God's word. Mm -hmm. Let it penetrate yeah. your heart and life. Be a Barnabas. Encourage somebody this week. Get alongside a fellow believer and encourage them, challenge them, give them the joy of the Lord and share your faith with others boldly, knowing that God will use you. And then pray, God, use me and show me uh, the results. It's a fantastic way to live. You'll enjoy it. You'll appreciate it. Thanks so much for being with us. Look forward to seeing you as you're going to register now uh, for Sunday yeah. service. And then uh, after Sunday, we'll see you again next week. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Let's pray together as we finish. Yeah. Father, I pray you'd bless the viewership today that they might be encouraged in the Lord. The Bible is so dynamic. Uh, you've given us your word and you've given us a way to follow you. I pray that you'll use us this coming week to glorify you in multiple ways. Thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks for being here. See you Sunday.